So, so it was nice to have an introduction like that from, from Mark Stewart, who's coached Emma George to 12 world records, and Steve Hooker to 591 or 5. So, you know, he's done a pretty good job himself. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's nice to be here in Melbourne. I, ha I, haven't been, I haven't been to Melbourne, it's funny, or to Australia for nine years. So the last time I came here was 2006 for the Commonwealth Games. And I came with, I came with this guy. Not that guy, that guy, but this guy up here. And uh, it was Steve Lewis. So he, this was his first major championships and he won Commonwealth Games bronze. And as you all know, in Glasgow, he managed to get all three now, so he has the collection gold, silver and bronze over the last three championships. So I was here with Steve and Kate um, nine years ago, so it's, it's uh, quite nice to be here again. It's been too long. And it was good because in 2006, I got to watch Kim Howe uh, win Commonwealth Games gold medal. And Kim was one of my athletes from Perth, and I, I started her career off, so it was really nice to uh, watch her win her gold medal. And, of course, the, the hometown favourite, um, in Melbourne, Mr. Hooker, so it's nice to, uh, to be here. So, and it's great to see some old friends as well. I had a picture of Maddie, so I thought I'd dig that one up. So, so we were in Taiwan a couple of years ago, and thankfully I saw those poles out the back here because they went missing on the way home, but I, I'm glad they finally made it back to Melbourne. And it was great. I've just been for a surfing trip with, with Mike and Mark, so it was, uh, it was really nice to, uh, to make that trip. And I've got to thank Mike for taking this picture of me on a 10 foot wave. This was three times overhead and Mike paddled out to get this shot of me taking off, about to take the drop. You can't believe how big this wave was. So it's funny to talk here in Australia about pole vault because this is where I started my career and a lot of you I've never met before. So I felt it was a little bit appropriate that I give you a bit of background on me and where I come from. So I started coaching in 1990. As a professional coach, I worked at the West Australian Institute of Sport and most of you probably don't recognise this guy, but he was the first guy I, I started to coach. It was a guy called James Miller. So I met James. He was a 13-year-old running 400 metres, and he ran 60 seconds for the 400. And I thought, that's not bad. I said, you want to try pole vault? And he said, yep. So he came down, and then the rest was history. And Jimmy broke every um, Australian age group record on the way through and then jumped 575 here at the Melbourne Grand Prix in 1996. So that was... Um, that was great effort. And then this guy came along, and this guy broke, Paul Burgess, broke every one of Jimmy's records. So it was by little bits, but then added on from there. And you know that uh, Paul jumped six metres. And this guy was a decathlete from Tasmania who's doing a bit of coaching now, uh, James Fitzpatrick. So they were three of the guys that I was working with when I, when I first started out. So I started my career in Perth, and then I went to uh, Columbia University in New York, and I worked there for a year as the head of field events. And then I spent 11 years with British Athletics and I was working at Loughborough University and I started up the High Performance Centre there. So it's um, like a one-stop shop for track and field. And uh, I set up the pole vault program there as well as the, the Performance Centre. I worked at Scottish Athletics for a year uh, and I'm now working at Finnish Athletics where I'm the um, head coach for pole vault. So I run all the national camps and look after the national team in Finland. So I'm pretty fortunate. I've had a professional coaching career now for 24 years, which is uh, not many people have managed to do. I've been five Olympic Games with three different federations. So I kind of think that this is quite a fitting little quote. Uh, I love getting older. My understanding deepens. I can see what connects. I can weave stories of experience and apply them. I can integrate the lesson. Things simply become more and more fascinating Beauty reveals itself in thousands of forms. So my experience of, of coaching many generations of pole vault is what I'm going to talk to you about today. So the system that I've put together didn't, didn't come about quickly. It came about by learning and doing and trial and error. So this is the fast track to how to coach pole vault. So there's a picture of Paul. It was a great photo done by Philip, so I thought I'd... I chucked that one up. So I'm not sure of you, how many of you have seen Paul jump, but he has quite an interesting progression. So when he was 14, he was, um, he was Australian all-round gymnast, and then he stopped gymnastics because he was getting too tall, and then he started a pole vault with me. So I came back from the World Championships in Stuttgart in 1993 in September, and Paul started pole vaulting then. And then already by March, he jumped 3 metres 90, on a 13 foot 160, 17 0 flex, it was a really stiff pole because he was a little, little guy then, much smaller than what he is now. 
and he had already a 30 centimetre push at such a young age. And his technical model basically in that six months was already formed to a very, very high level. You know, if I had to give him a technical rating out of 10, he was probably scoring eight and a half or nine out of 10. So over a period of time, obviously poles got longer, grips got higher, pushes got greater as he physically developed. But it was quite nice because I spend a lot of time now coaching athletes who are already quite proficient pole vaulters. So I have to go through this detraining and retraining process. But having coached this guy from day one, and he was my second generation of pole vaulter, I was able to lay the foundations correctly from the beginning. And you can see that the flexes of poles he used were always very, very stiff because he had this amazing push. One meter 28 was his push when he jumped six meters. So you can see, he could really fly, you know, it was an amazing push. So one of the girls I coached in, in Britain, she was Commonwealth Games bronze medalist in Delhi, a girl called uh, Kate Dennison. She was, she was a different kind of athlete because I got her later on in her career. She jumped four metres for three years in a row and had stagnated. And she came to me and she said, Steve, will you help me? I said, okay, sure, let's try and work it out. So we went through that detraining process and then retraining. And you can see she was jumping on 425 poles, I took her back to a 4.15 pole trying to get her more stable and then she jumped 4.11 in the first year with me and then she progressed up to 4.35 and 4.40. And then we went to the Beijing Olympics and in the Beijing Olympics she had serious Achilles problems that we'd been nursing for the 12 months beforehand. And the team doctor assessed her in Beijing and said, okay, you need to get double Achilles surgery. And this was a... a a point in her career which I would describe as a personal awakening. Every athlete in their career has a certain time when they, they, de they develop or decide that they're going to do this for serious. So she went from 440 to 460, which never should have happened because we'd already been working together for five years. I didn't ch change the way I was coaching, but her approach to pole vault changed. And I think having double Achilles surgery after Beijing, she realized that she's not going to be doing this forever. And it was really a turning point in her career, you know. And I'll show you these records here. So this is 4.45 in British Championships. And then I think this was 448, something like that in France. And then this was in Prague, our first outdoor comp. European Teams Championships in Leora, 455. Uh, this is in Madrid, 4.56. British Championship, 4.57. Uh, London Grand Prix, 4.58. World Championships in Berlin. This was a British record, but it was an important jump because she finished six of World Champs with this jump. And then 460, in Stetchen. This is the following indoor season in, in Wuppertal. And then 460, Berman Grand Prix. So you might ask, why did we go up one centimetre at a time? Anybody know why? Growth money. There you go. $5,000 a time. <laughs> and a lot of those records were done a week apart. So quite often if she jumped like British, at the British Championship she jumped 457, 
So she said to me, what do we do next? What height next? And then the following week, we had London Grand Prix, which had prize money gained. So I said 470, because I thought, OK, if you jump 470, then fine. I'm not worried about it. But <laughs> she didn't jump 470, obviously. So then the following week, she did British record again. So it's just had to eke it out, a little bit of business there. But you can see there, for a lot of you who haven't been to Europe, there's a lot of the European indoor meets there, which is, a, you know, we do indoors, outdoors, indoors, outdoors, where you guys obviously only have uh, one, one season. So it's quite a, quite a different kind of atmosphere and I really like the indoor competitions because the crowd's very tight there's lots of music clapping and they're they're really like pole vaulting shows so if we get a chance to go to Europe in the Aussie summer for the European winter then then do it it's a, it's a great experience so I thought it's good to look back a little bit of history because we've got a lot of young pole vaulters here and many of you haven't seen how pole vault originated so this is a video of kids in Finland playing um, in the in the 60s and I think it's really important this because we forget how pole vault started you know kids in Finland they do this in their back garden they get an old bit of tree bit of wood they tell me that A&E wards were full of kids with broken arms and legs and you couldn't find a decent stick anywhere. And this was around the time 62, Pente Nicola set three world records, five meters, 505 and 510 on the same day. So it was, pole vaulting was really, really, really big at the time, very popular sport. And then this is the NCAA championships, the American college championships in the 60s. So you can see the guys jumping here with steel pole and they're jumping 13 feet, which is four meters landing in sawdust. So for those of you who haven't seen steel pole vaulting before, then watch how athletic these guys were. Watch how they moved the pole, and they didn't, they weren't so obsessed with bending the pole. And then we go to modern day pole vaulting. So Sergei Buka jumping in America and you can see the difference now in flexible pole vaulting. I think this jump was around 585. On a pace of fiberglass pole. Do you notice that Mark? Okay, so I think it's really interesting that since poles have started to bend, many techniques have developed and we've lost a little bit the feeling of moving the pole. And you can see here the stiff pole vaulter and then my friend Jeff Hartwick, superimposed on the back here, the bending pole vaulter. So the key thing I'm going to talk about is about moving the pole and not just thinking about bending the pole. So it's key that you have a technical model. So it's really important you have a technical model that you work to and that you understand. So every coach, every athlete needs to have a technical model that they know what's happening at every step of the jump. Now, here's three Aussie guys. So this man here, Alan Launder, was responsible for the book, Beginning of Booker. I think it's most the best book written in pole vault. And Alan always talks about the technical model and having a technical model. And in my... Um, uh, experience, the guys that have taught me or the guys that I've learned a lot from and my technical model formed from is these, these guys here, which is all coming from the Russian school, the Russian technical model for pole vault. So Vitaly Petrov is a picture of me, Jimmy and Vitaly in uh, Canberra 1994. So these are the guys that influenced me in my career. Key thing, width of grip. And this has a lot of the deciding factors. So what you want to do is you want to put your top hand on your shoulder and your bottom hand wants to be out and relaxed. Your bottom hand doesn't want to be way out here or way in. It wants to be relaxed. So I tried to find as many Aussie volters as I could for these photos. So here's not an Australian volter. Left hand. So the left elbow wants to be below the left wrist. You don't want to carry the pole with the left elbow up like this. You want to support the pole with your skeletal system, okay? Bottom hand wants to be two hands from your chest. So one, two hands from your chest. Not down here, not all the way up here. Just in a relaxed position. And this is key, right hand wants to be relaxed. So the right hand wants to be like this, not like this, OK? 
Okay? And I'll explain why. Grip. So grip on the pole. So quite a lot of Australian pole vaulters use black tape. So this is not a new thing to you, but a lot of countries where I talk, people use only chalk or they use other methods. Now the key with the black tape is the fact that you don't have to over grip the pole. You don't want to be holding the pole with as much grip strength as you possibly can because otherwise it limits the amount of movement you can get in your shoulder. So you want to be gripping the pole with just enough tension in your hands to make sure the pole doesn't come out of your hand. So the, the black spray and lighter fuel combination gives that nice wet sticky grip which works well in rain and dry weather. Now, a lot of Australian pole boys don't have to jump in rain very often, but if you go to a World Juniors or somewhere like that where it's raining, it's good to make sure that you can grip a pole when it is raining. So, soft hands. So you can see here, Kate Dennison has a relaxed right hand and a relaxed left hand. So I'm looking for the hands to be relaxed like this and not closed. It's good to also note posterior chain development on Kate as well. Very good hamstring, glute, lower back development. So here's an example also of soft hands. You can see this hand is not closed, this hand's relaxed. So what you want to do with this hand is you don't want to close this hand till just before the pole's going to hit the box. So here is the alternative method. You can see hand closed, hand closed. But what the problem is, when you close this hand, you can see how the shoulder is getting pulled in. Okay, and it's an, it looks unnatural. It looks tight, it looks difficult. It makes it difficult for the shoulders to move when you're planting the pole. And here, you can see Joel is using relaxed front hand and a tighter back hand. So a lot of boys, it's easier for the girls to have a relaxed backhand than the boys because they use a shorter pole. So I kind of work with the guys that struggle with an open backhand to do what we call cupping and then resting their fingers on the pole rather than grabbing it like that. So Joel's got very good bottom hand. This hand here is quite, quite tight. And it has consequences then when it comes to planting the pole. So if we talk now about running. So the key thing here is dorsiflexion of the feet. So this is dorsiflexion, this is plantiflexion. You always want to keep your foot dorsiflex through the whole running cycle. You never want to let your foot plantiflex as it's about to contact the ground because that's like putting your foot on the brake. So you don't go accelerator brake, accelerator brake, accelerator brake when you're driving your car, do you? So you don't want to do the same thing when you're running. So heel and knee recover together. So what we want is as the heel is coming off the ground, the knee needs to move up as well. If I don't lift my knee up, then my heel has nowhere to go but backwards, okay? So it's important with the dorsiflex foot, the hip flexor needs to fire up to pick my knee up so my heel can follow. You don't want to run in action that's all out the back. You want to make sure that it's coming up and through. Heel to butt, heel to knee, knee, knee to parallel. So we're looking for this on the recovery side. And then as we're coming back down, foot steps over the knee, grabs back into the track. So we want this kind of action, it's hard because this is my good leg and I've got a mic in there, so I have to use my bad leg. So we want to be coming up and then we want to be grabbing back. And see, so keeping dorsiflexion all the time, we're not coming here, plantiflexing flexing in the strike at the back. And if I'm here like this, we'll do this a bit later in the practical. So my foot's coming up and through and I've got nothing going out the back, okay? Anything that's coming out the back is bad. You've got to make sure you're coming up and through. If you're standing from behind, you can't see, I'll use my other leg, you can't see the sole of my shoe, can you? Which is a good indicator that somebody is getting the heel recovery correct. If somebody's heel is going like that, then you know that they're not lifting up at the front fast enough. Okay, so run up. The generic things we run up. I like standing start, so because it makes it much more accurate at the end if you don't have variations at the start. Most of the problems at the end of the run up start in the first four steps. So if you're not picking this foot up, if you're not skipping onto the start of your run, then you will get much more accurate run which will help you get a better takeoff position. So I like to keep the weight on the front foot, the 
whole foot on the ground, lean back, keep the heel on the ground, then move forward, okay? So that was one of the big things with Kate. We decided at the end of one outdoor season that we were no longer going to start with a lifting foot. So when we started training in September, October time from two, four, six steps, every time she lifted her foot, I said, stop, jumped on the track and then made us start again. So we, and then we actually, it took us about six months. She got out of that habit and then it controlled her run much better. So generally now, world-class men use 18 steps. Not many guys are using 20. Most world-class girls use 16 steps. When I was in Prague last weekend at European Indoors, the girls, nobody was on 18, they were all on 16. Mid-marks, very important to check the mid-mark and to check the takeoff. Because if you check the mid-mark, Americans do it at four steps, but six steps is a much better place, in my opinion, to check the mid-mark. Then you can see what's happening in variation in the first part of the run to the second part of the run. And it just gives you another point of feedback. Mid-mark is for the coach, it's not for the athlete. Athlete's not looking at the mid-mark and then going, it's what point that the coach is looking at. Most Australians use mid-mark, so that's, I'm preaching to the converted a little bit. Most men between 16 and 17, there's of course variations on that. Someone like Steve Hooker was much, much more, but he had quite a long stride, possibly overstride him. Most girls between 14 and 15. Kate was around 14, 50. Takeoff for girls generally is around 350 and for boys is four meters. Of course, there's extremes to that. Some boys take off closer than four. Someone like Lavanier takes off at 450, 460. Someone like Dmitry Markov also took off a long way out. Some girls are taking off up to four meters. Eliza takes off quite a long way out. Jeremy? 380. 380, yep. It's quite a long distance takeoff for a big girl. Some girls are a bit closer, but they're general rules of thumb to work from. Okay, so planting the pole. So the pole should be gradually lowered over the whole amount of the run. So we should be starting with the pole, like we said before, two hands from the chest, and the pole is gradually lowering as we're coming towards the box. It's important that we lower the pole. This is the fulcrum. We lower the pole by bringing the right hand up and not by bringing the left hand down. Okay, that's really important. We want left hand up and we want to bring the right hand up to lower the pole. So, these are the last three steps. So, as the left foot contacts, this hand should be coming under the armpit. As the right foot, the hands move then before the right foot contacts, the hands move again then before the left foot contacts. So it's important you get hands before feet in the last three steps. So we're gradually lowering over the whole length of the run, eight steps just below the hip, six steps on the hip, four steps just above the hip, so then it's hands just under the armpit, left step, whoops, that's the mic in my pocket that's putting me off balance. <laughs> left step, right step, left step, okay? Hands, feet, hands, feet. It's important you do it in that order. Okay, so the other thing as well is it's really important with the plant, and we'll do this with the plant drills outside. You want to make sure that the hand is turning over the chest. And this is the key thing we do in all of the drills. You don't want the hand turning out. You want the hand turning over the chest, so you're in this position and to push high into the plant. And that, this movement here is key to getting a smooth transition. And all the people in the world that have a good smooth plant get this hand to turn over. But Renault Levin needs a world record holder. He jumps 6'16", and he comes like this, and then comes like this. So there's a good example of not following somebody who's the best at their sport, because his plant's terrible. It's getting better, but he looks like he's casting a fishing rod, you know? It's just amazing. But since he changed from Damien to Philippe. I know Philippe's working on it, and Philippe's other athletes are better, but Renault just gets away with it. But it wants to come like this, and the hand wants to turn over the chest, okay? So, takeoff. We want to make sure we've got a forward body lean. We don't want to be leaning back on takeoff. We want a forward body lean on takeoff. We want to make sure we have an active takeoff foot. So by that I mean that the foot should be coming down, striking the ground and grabbing back. We don't want to come down and do this, okay? It's obvious, it sounds obvious. If you're always coaching long jump and your long jumper runs up and goes like this, then you would coach the long jumper to where you have an active foot. 
but a huge number of pole vaulters come in and do this with their foot. They kill all of their horizontal velocity. And then they spend all their time with their coach trying to be faster runners when they lose two meters per second on takeoff because they do this. This is super important to making sure you move forward. But it's very difficult to do if you're carrying a long pole and trying to lower it into a box. So the combination of moving hands, focally steering, and trying to get an active foot is very difficult to do. That's why we have to do hundreds and hundreds of drills. I'll finish this slide and then, we'll, uh, then we can adjourn for pizza. Chest should be open. So by this I mean that the chest should come in open. You shouldn't come down like this. When you do this with your foot, that's blocking the takeoff. When you do this with your hands, that's blocking the swing. Two things are both blocking. High top hand. So you want to try and get this ground pole angle as high as possible. You have to maximize every inch of height you've got. Relax shoulders so that we can get shoulders to come in, then come back. And the bottom arm, the elbow should be turned out. Okay? You don't want to have your bottom arm locked in behind you like this because that blocks the chest. Okay?